you for being with us here tonight, Mr. Mentor. Elections are just around the corner. All of us here, we are 30 or below 30 first-time voters, some of the second-time voters. Um, well, really, there are a lot of burning questions in our mind. For, for starters, I would like to say, with all the walkovers, the, the, um, you know, perhaps the walkovers, and also um, what seems to be political apathy among the population, why are elections important for Singapore today? Well, if we didn't have elections, and MPs and ministers do not have to renew their mandate, then you're going to get complacent, and you become feeble, and you become corrupt. Mr. Lee, you said that it's important for MPs, you know, to, you know, elections are important because MPs need a mandate. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of MPs don't have the mandate. In the last election, only seven of, you know, 20-odd new PAP candidates got, actually got voted in. Let me correct the public impression of that. The fact that you don't have an opposition means that the opposition doesn't believe they stand a chance. That's why they don't turn up. There are very high stakes in being elected in parliament or to parliament and even higher stakes if you can get half the majority of the seats because then you're in charge of the government and you know we've got over 100 million US dollars in reserves and all the assets that we now have in Tamasic, Singtel and a whole lot of it, SIA etc. It's the biggest prize, people fight to capture a company, right? Here you're fighting to capture the government. But there what? isn't much of a fight. Why? No, suppose they stand a chance of winning. Would they stay away? There are so many people with so many bright ideas. But you've got to beat the incumbent. And the incumbent is not lazy. It's not crooked. It's not inefficient. And it's vigorous. Very few parties have lasted as we have, the PAP, since 1959 in government. That's 47 years. The LDP in Japan, after 30 plus years, they got into trouble because well, too many kickbacks, construction contracts, etc. We run a clean ship. No grease. But quite aside from the fact that, you know, the government is efficient, yeah. the party is clean, but you've also erected all kinds of barriers of entry for the opposition. And one barrier is the GRC. Yeah. Is it really necessary for Singapore to have GRCs? I mean, since it was um, imposed in 1988, what the opposition have been saying is that the GRCs are a way in which to um, give them a lesser chance of contesting in the general elections. What's your take on that? First, why do we have GRCs? Because we could not get single minority candidates or women elected. In the early elections, just being a PAP candidate got you elected. But after a while, the electorate got wise and smart, says, oh, we'll have a PAP government. I don't like this. Why an Indian? He can't speak my Teochew or Hokkien. I choose the Chinese. Uh, Mr. Lee, but that's not true. I mean, in 84, you had people like uh, Abbas Abu Amin, 88, Abdullah Tamugi. I mean, the minority, strong minority candidates no, no, no. have never been absent. That was with the PAP in complete control. That generation voted for the PAP. But why can't you do with a system where you don't have such huge GRCs, five members? No, no, just a moment. Member. Let me finish this. Let me, I'll come to that. You watch the candidates that we are giving in the single wards. Do we feel a minority? Do we feel a woman? No. You watch the opposition. Will they have a, minority, a woman or a minority challenging a Chinese male? No. Because they know that on the ground, they cannot win. 
Do you feel it's a vicious circle in the sense that you're perpetuating what this lack of confidence perhaps in the voting public? No, no. How, this is not lack of confidence in the voting public. These are basic visceral uh, emotional biases. I don't like this happy because he can't understand me. He is Malay and I'm not Malay. And the Malay voters want a Malay MP. It's a reality. So, okay, no. can't we have a smaller GRC? Yeah. yeah. We can. There are two reasons why we don't. First, we think this is a good system to test the capability of the opposition. Because when you win a GRC, you have to run all the town councils, and the town councils should really comprise the whole of a new town. And you've got five years to prove that you can run it properly. So it's not just making speeches in Teochew or Hokkien or whatever. Having made all those speeches and having got in, you've got five years to prove yourself in Parliament and produce results in the constituency. But what does that have to do with the numbers? Mm. Yeah. yeah. No, because even five or six do not comprise a whole new town. You take Pasiris. Five, six. Then you have to decant, like Bedok, East Coast. The population shifts to Tampines and to Pasiris Senkang. So you shift. But in the end, what we want to have is a system where if you win because you're a good populist leader, you make good speeches, you're able to convince them convince the population over a short period of time that, you know, give us a try. After that, demonstrate your capability. Because when you win half the electorate, half the votes, half the seats, you're going to run this government. Okay, even, even when they do win the, you know, the constituencies and control of the town council, there is an absolute limit as to what they can do because they don't get the same government grants, the CIPC funds, for upgrading and other such project improvements. Now, just a moment. We are not saying they will not get the grants. We are saying that we give the grants and look after the constituencies that voted for us well, first. The reality is that Mr. Lau <laughs> Teakang in Aukang has the had control for a long time. Reality, and he, hasn't, he hasn't had... You're you know. quite right. The reality is that Potong Pase and Ho Kang will have to wait their turn at the end of the queue. It's, it's as simple as that. Look, ask yourself. Does any government help the opposition to displace itself? Is it the business of the government? You watch the Malaysians. When they lose Kalantan and Tranganu, they close the oil, for, oil funds for, for Tranganu. Mahade says, no, this goes to the centre. Kalantan, they deprive it of development funds. So, you mean to tell me in America, or in Britain, they give benefits to all constituencies equally. At the same time, or worse, favor the opposition? No. You favor your supporters because you want to retain them as your supporters. So how much does the PAP want to win back Potong Pasir and Hokka? <laughs> you heard what the Prime Minister said. When we fight, we fight to win. But extending that back to the... Sir, asked, what good does it do for PAP to win all 84 seats? It will just probably just increase the dissatisfaction on the, on the part of I the think Singaporeans. I what want to ask is whether you think a complete elimination of the opposition is really what you think is Benefit. best for Singapore. No. You will never completely the eliminate the opposition. Why not? It seems like you, have <laughs> you, may, eliminate, yeah. you may eliminate them temporarily from Parliament. We, I eliminate, or they eliminated themselves in 1965 when Barisan had 13 out of 51 seats, and they said, bogus independence, fake, we leave. So we fielded in all by-elections, 
And from 55 to 81, in three elections, we swept the polls with opposition. So is, is that the state that you, you really want you know, Singapore politics to have? Because well, the, the, bearing in mind that you, you, your GRC system results in walkovers, you have a young generation of people who really don't care about politics, A, I, or B, they are even fearful. If they do get to vote, they, they are fearful. <laughs> Gen, you're talking about old people and young people who are fearful to vote against the PAP. So is, is this the system no, that we really want? Are you, know? you fearful to vote against the PAP? Are you fearful to vote against the PAP? Perhaps, yes, honestly, a little bit. <laughs> why? Tell me why. What will happen to you? How would we know that you voted against us? You know, you know, you know no, no, yes, <laughs> I think we all know the answer can we, to that. Can we just, like... No, no, no let's, let's pursue this okay. because I'm afraid. Yeah. You tell me you've gone through O levels, A levels, university, mm. working in... 938 Live, and you are afraid if you vote against the baby, something will happen to you? Um, well, okay. First, I think would... this, this is the impression that the, yeah. PAP, the PAP has created. <laughs> no, you are spreading that impression. No, no actually, oh. I'm really <laughs> you can ask everyone of oh. us here. And, and to that effect, that there isn't a level playing field for the opposition in the terms of. There is no upgrading. level playing field of any government helping its opposition to win votes. I think going back to the point where you said, how, do, how will the PAP know that we vote, who we voted for? <laughs> what SM said the other, um, just yesterday about the, the area, Realty Park, I think, mm -hmm. you know, 60% of, if, if more than 60% of them vote for the PAP, they will get the upgrading. So how does the PAP know it's 60%? No, but, so how, how no, can the residents we, not be we fearful can guess, that right, you actually check into... No, we can guess from our campaigning and our house-to-house -house visits. But we won't know who comprises that 60%, right? You don't need to know that to strike fear, though. I, don't I can't think. move it. <laughs> you mean to tell me you, you, have, you are one of the 40% that voted against the PAP and something happens to you? Well, I mean, I've never I... voted for that matter. But, I mean, we talk to hundreds of voters, you know, in, in the course of our work. And it's, you no, know, no, no. no comment or, you know, if I vote against the PAP, no. I may... Let, let's get down. What are the hundreds of voters? You, you name the hundreds of voters, a few of them, tell me. Well, I mean, I can't name them <laughs> no, no. by name. No, no. You tell me who you have spoken to and they say we are afraid to vote well, against them. a few the weeks ago, the Straits yeah. Times did a report. We polled a hundred voters. No, no, no. no. Mr. Lee. You, never mind the Straits Times poll. You made a statement just now. Look, I started life as a cross-examiner, right? You made a statement just now. <laughs> that I spoke to a hundred persons and they were all afraid. I said, name them. Tell me who. Why should I name them on no, national therefore television? therefore tell me, it's not I spoke to them. Straits Times carried the poll. Did you carry out the poll? I was one of the reporters. No. Who did you carry out the poll? Yes, I did. How did you carry out the poll? We went out and we asked a hundred voters yeah. what they thought. How many voters did you ask? Well, we had to get more no. than 100. How many voters did you ask? It was about 120. You yourself personally? I spoke to about 40. Yeah. You spoke to 40. Mm. And did they tell you that you noted down I have answers? Yes, I do have most of yeah. their names, yeah. Some of them didn't want to identify yeah. themselves. No. What did they tell you? Well, they said, you know, well, we asked them, yeah. you know, who do you think will win? We're not asking you what your vote is. But, you know, who do you think will win in this coming election? And some of them say, oh, it's hard to say. Some of them say, oh, you know, I think Lao Tia Kiang still has, you know, enough to hang on. And some just say, uh, no, I, I better not say, otherwise... So, when you say some of the 40, I better not say, you assume they're scared to tell you? Yeah, because they say, you know, it's not something that you can prove no, in a no, court no, of no. law, but, but it's something no, you can no, you sense. Are making, that is the point I'm saying. You are in the media, you are in the Straits Times, you are purveying an unnecessary falsehood. We have said categorically, the vote is secret. This started off with Jai Ratnam saying, oh, they are afraid. So we said, right, here are the boxes. Count, finish the count, lock up. Go to the Supreme Court, it's locked up, time up, 
incinerator, you can see all election agents watch is burnt. But if you can and you are going out as the Straits Times man. How many said we are afraid? They didn't tell you we are afraid. They just said, no, no, I don't want to say something. And on that you say, one, you started off with a statement, 100, over 100 told you they were afraid. No, I didn't say that. You said that. It's on. Please. I do not, I haven't lost my memory. We can go back on the tape. As I told you, I allow my grandchildren to speak back to me. But from time to time, when they are out of bounds, I put them down. And when you make that statement without any evidence, I have to put it to you, get to the bottom of it. And you interviewed not 100, but 40. And a few of them said, oh, I'd rather not say. And therefore, you assume they were afraid. How are they afraid? Because we terrify them. Isn't it your job to say there's nothing to be afraid? Are you afraid? Surely you're not. But Mr. Lee, many people out in the streets don't buy the argument behind a large number of GRCs. Neither same logic, same thing, same situation no. behind the electoral boundaries, the election deposit. No. We just think that the PAP is playing with unfair rules and is power crazy. What do no, you have no. to say about it? Let me tell you what I would do if I were the opposition. Right? I would first contest a single seat and win, which is possible. Ding Haodong did it. Chen Chen, Chen Chen also did it. Chiam, Lo Kiang. I did it in 1955. From that one single seat, I expanded my base. I built up a following in the unions. I built up a following across the country through my speeches in Parliament and the positions I took that proved to be better than the positions taken yes. by the Prime Minister of the time. Mr. Lee, but or how the would Chief you... Minister. No, how... just okay. let me finish. Having done that, I will then find four or five equally capable people. And I will choose a GRC and I say, look, you compare them, compare us. And with the ground in Singapore as it is, one thing in opposition, we know that. All of you want an opposition, right? Not true. You're young, you want to vote, you want to, you want to see a fight in parliament. You want to see the, the heat and dust of a clash in the arena. Well, if there are any good, you will vote for them. But Mr. Lee, can I just I, I add in, Mr. Lee? I, I do not think that we as young people want to see necessarily a fight. I think what we want is to have a choice. What we I, want I, is political I, vibrancy. What we want is a, a media that could reflect both the views of the opposition as well as the ruling party fairly. What we want is to see that you know, the political, uh, the opposition is being given a level playing field. Yeah. What we want is fairness let, in the political let, let sphere. Pause, let me pause there. I, I told you my training is that of a lawyer, right? What is there to prevent you from giving Lo Tia Kiang and Jiang Si Tong full coverage? Self-censorship. A lot of that exists. No, no, come on. Yeah. You can see his speeches in Parliament. They're all in Hazard, word for word. On important occasions, his questions and answers are telecast. You can build on He can build on that. But where is the substance? As the Americans say, where is the beef? Little tactical points here and there. Where is the alternative to the policies we are following? I'll give you a simple illustration. Look at their manifesto. I mean, this is ad nauseum. You know? Abolish GRCs. Abolish grassroots organization. Abolish the elected presidency. We spent over 40 years building up institutions which will keep the community together. You go back, ignore this quotas on race in buildings, 
HDB buildings. You go back to the old days, Malays one constituency, Indians another constituency. I lived through that. I saw riots, I saw unhappiness. And we made a critical decision, starting from 1965 as we rebuilt Singapore, that we will have a totally mixed up population. The population will be live with each other, go to the same schools, go to the same shops, go to the same community centers, same playing fields. I think that was the right decision. But once we did that, <laughs> there is no minority seat available. So the GRC became an important way to bring them in. Now let me say why it is dangerous to go back to the old. We can still go back if we want to. We just removed the race quota. And I think within three, four elections, you'll have Malay constituency, Indian constituency, because it's a natural uh, bias, proclivity to have people of the same kind. So if I'm short of curry, I just go next door. So are you saying that all these rules that exist to create an unlevel playing field is for a good reason and it's not, it does not exist just to keep the opposition weak? If it does us harm, we would never do it. It does us good and it will do the opposition good to be able to win and prove themselves. Mr. Lee, personally, you can do, do you a smaller no, no. GRC? I've told you, I can, if I were Lo Tia Kiang, you know, therefore I suggested to Lo Tia Kiang and Chiam in a uh, straightforward way. Chiam has been there 20 years, Lo Tia Kiang has been there 15 years. He's had all the exposure in Parliament. Take on a GRC, but watch whether he will do it or not. But you have taken all the people yeah. and impose such unfair rules. No, no. That it's... I have taken all the people, I have taken all the capable people, right, to be our candidates. The problem is, he cannot find capable people to match the PAP. That's the nub of it all. So you think that a Singapore with a dominant party a ruling sweep? without a good without a good opposition to check? So would you say the opposition at this imbalance. moment is unnecessary then? Oh, I do not say, I, I've not said that and I've never said that. What I'm saying is the opposition that we have is not up to mark. I think is my that? concern no. personally is yeah. that you have said yourself we cannot guarantee that PAP government 20 years down the road would be clean and as good as it is today. Yeah. So we have created a system such that the playing field is so skewed that it's impossible <laughs> for us to have no. a, yeah. a good check. You know, what if the PAP misgoverns? How are we no. going to counter that? Let me, let me put this quite simply this way. With that present mood, if you reflect the mood on the ground, there must be at least 30, 40 percent, maybe 45 percent, right? who want a, a strong opposition to check the PAP. Suppose you had capable people with a track record, people who have done 10, 15 years as business leaders, doctors, lawyers, dentists, engineers, whatever, computer programmers, they get together. You think they cannot win? It's a different proposition, isn't it? Is the PAP insecure about lo losing? <laughs>
something you package. You're selling the candidate as a product. Isn't that what PEP is doing too? No. Why don't you let voters decide? A podcast is not a face-to-face -face conference. If you were writing an article, you wouldn't today. We would have had this exchange, right? You write the wrong piece and I write a letter to the press and we ding dong. But because we are face to face, I pointed out to you that what you made, the first statement, you spoke to uh, over hundreds of No, I, I can't let you get by, you know. It was a misrepresentation of the facts. Then you say, I, I interviewed 40. Then I said, how many who were afraid? None. Mom, but why can't you use said, the same forum no, and rebut no, no. then? I mean, why can't you, you know, I, someone blogs, why can't you block back and let no, no. voters decide? I think the reason why <laughs> they're doing this is because they do not have any other platform. And I think the reason, um, to add on to that, I think it's not just important in itself to have these blogs and things, but what they, the implications they have for building a civil society, granted we lack that, and the mindset in Singapore seems to be such that, oh, I'll mind my own business, make my money, and leave the politics to the politicians. And in that sense, the implications are, are scary for nation building. When you talk about nation building, because you have people who have this sentiment, they do not really care about the core of the nation, which is who governs my country. People, my friends have told me, you know, I'm going to the votes for the first time, but why vote? Uh, I know it's going to win anyway. So when people do not care about who, or making, uh, having a voice in who governs the country, how can then you, you build uh, a sentiment that, bonds them emotionally to the nation, to build a nation, to give them a sense of emotional connection, engagement with the country. No, you're, you're, you're putting a thesis which I find completely unsu unfounded. You mean to tell me that what's happening in Thailand or in the Philippines is bonding the people into a nation or dividing them? Mm. To put it another way, maybe, yeah. bearing in mind the unlevel playing field, bearing in mind the numerous walkovers, all the restrictions regarding podcasts and etc., how does a PAP win, when it happens, signal a strong mandate for the party? The very fact that we are not challenged is a pretty strong mandate. Why have they not challenged me for the last three elections? I'm old. I'm not so active as before, but I'm still fairly effective, right? And my ground knows that I'm effective. Why do they know that? Because they see me, they see their lives improve. I've got an organization on the ground that makes sure that they are attended. And I, attend, I make sure that I got people who are looking after them. So my not being challenged in three successive elections it's not because I have no mandate, it's because nobody believes they are likely to win. So, no, no, let me, let me finish it. So I am taking in this time three new candidates. One of them will be a potential minister. I would welcome a contest. But if there's no contest, let me tell you that he will turn out to be like another Corbyn one. In four and a half years, he will prove himself. And then Corbyn one goes to Sambawang, and everybody knows he can deliver. Mr. Lee, I believe that the lack of competition is due to the lack of level playing field. <laughs> Singapore always believes in fair competition, right? So where does this fair competition come in, in the, in the in the elections itself? You know, I was told by Dian Pritt, he was a communist MP. I brought him out here to defend uh, some socialist club students for treason. And he said, the capitalists are both unfair. So every time election comes, he finds all the halls already booked. And in England it's cold. In winter, you can't have an open air meeting. So the Conservatives and the Labour Party would have block, blocked out all the halls, so they got to use tiny little rooms. And all the media was blocked by either Labour, pro Labour owners or pro Conservative owners, and they only had the Daily Worker with a small circulation. There is no fair playing field between political parties. It's as simple as that. I came in. First election, 
PAP. We won three seats. Plus one independent who joined us, four. Was it fair? I had the whole media against me. Straits Times, Cao Pao. No, not Cao Pao. Nanyang Xiang Pao. Xing Zhou Zhi Pao. Why am I so strong against the media? Because they tried to put us down, they twisted everything I said, that I was a communist, when they knew I wasn't. So I told them, in 1959, during the election campaign, as they were gunning for me, I said, when I win, I will show you how you have to behave yourself. But Mr. Lee, you said that at that point no, of time. No, let me... It's, the media is not setting the agenda for Singapore. If you want to set the agenda, you must put your stakes in and say, come out. You are not setting the agenda surreptitiously, creating this issue, creating that issue. Any misdeed, any misdoing by the, any officer, any government, bring it out. It's, that's how you keep the government clean, right? But you are not settling the agenda. I will not allow the foreign media to set the agenda. So every misrepresentation, we have a reply. So there's an assumption no, that... just a moment. So you can say whatever you like in your newspapers. But please remember, there will be a reply, and there will be a robust reply. Do you... So there's an assumption that yeah. the, the, part, the party that knows the best and is the cleverest is the government. <laughs> no, no, no. For the time being... The best candidates are in the PAP. Are you not worried, though, given the political apathy that we are seeing, especially among the young? I think there's really two. two no, how can of you young... talk about no, there's, political there's, apathy? There's really are, two groups of young You are people. so agitated by it all. But, but there's us. no apathy. But that's us. And for every one of us, there's ten <laughs> more out there who don't know. No, I no, mean, no. I've I've seen people who mm. are in polytechnics and universities. They don't know who their prime minister is. They don't know who you are. And they don't no, find no, no. it important. Yeah, and they really don't care. Thing. So, I mean, given the, the, the situation, aren't you afraid that this would impact your party's renewal no, no, no. chances in the long run, say 10, 20, 30 years down the road? You assume that politics is about elections and election contests. I do not see politics that way. Mm -hmm. If you look up a dictionary, I think, I think the best definition of politics is one I found in the, an American dictionary which said, the art or science of governance, of government or governance of a country and how it runs its internal and external relations. Now, that's a very abstract concept. Translated in real life, it means, how is my life affected by the government? Do I have a job? Do I have a home? Do I have medicine when I need it? Do I have enough recreational facilities? Is there a future for my children? Will they be educated? Will there be a chance to advance yourself? If you do not have any of these things, you're going to find agitation. You have no recollection of this because you were not born. But in the 1950s and the 1960s, Singapore was in a state of agitation every day. You look up your old Straits Times and Sao Pao, uh, Sing Chou Zhe Pao, even the uh, you know, archives. Look at the riots, the ghost roads, the strikes. Why? No homes. Half the children were not in schools. 14% unemployment and underemployment. Pirate taxi drivers. No job. So I take a car, pay no license, no insurance. You take your chances, come in, I give you a ride. 50 cents, 20 cents and so on. Hawkers all over the place. Today, over 40 years, we have transformed it because 
assiduously we attended to the politics of life. That's what it's about. What is the future? Can you... If I can have another political party, you can have another political party to look after you the way the PAP has, I say, my job is done, finished. I can go home and sit back and read the books I want to read. So how, long, how long do you think Singapore can survive without the PAP in power? Once the PAP goes soft, it will be displaced. How long? I hope it never, it never happens, but if it happens, it'll be displaced. Yes. Mr. Lee, what is your yardstick for measuring what is a quality candidate? And why do you say that the opposition has no quality <laughs> candidates? <laughs> if you can't answer that, you are, you are in the International Chamber of Commerce? Singapore International Chamber of Commerce. If you don't know what a quality person is... But what is your definition of a quality candidate? It's obvious. You just look at our candidates and you see competence, but integrity. Are they, are they your first choice candidates? Are they the best that you can get or are they the second tier after the first choice has refused to come enter politics? They are the best that you could find. Some of the first tier accepted. Some says, no, not this time. I've got growing up children. And if they come out and contest, so when, when would you think of um, stepping back and retiring, not contesting another election? So when, when would you think of um, stepping back and retiring, not contesting another election? The moment I'm no longer of use to the government and to the constituents that I serve. Mr. Lee. But let me put it like this. The store of knowledge, I'm not being immodest, but the store of knowledge I had through the experiences I've been through, through the Japanese occupation, uh, my learning experience in Britain four years after, immediately after the war, the problems we face here. There's a data bank here that I think the younger ministers will take some time to equal. Supposing I can put like a computer, you know, put it into a thumb drive <laughs> and then they can access it, then I say, all right, call it quits. Many say you're still pulling the strings from behind. What do you have Sorry? to say about Many say because you're still in power, you're still in politics, there's always that perception that you're pulling strings from behind. What do you have to say? Why not just quash the rumours once and for all and step up in or politics and enjoy? Would you like me to step out of politics? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just conveying the message. No, no. <laughs> My, I'm asking you a simple question. Would you like me to step out of politics? You could still contribute outside of politics. Why well, not just stay as an MP, not <laughs> as the MM? Yeah. And still contribute to the war? Let, 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 me, let me answer that question. There are things which I can do as a minister in government, which I believe, and the Prime Minister knows it, and the senior minister, and I think the cabinet ministers also know, that no other person can do. It's as simple as that. So it's worth the rumours existence then? I mean, because of the good because of the work that you can do in, in the cabinet is worth with do you think it detracts hearing all these rumours confidence all in the second and third generation do you, do you think believe for one them? moment that my son and before him go chop down my son is 50 uh, 53 years old 54 coming on to hasn't a mind of his own he needs me to whisper how to answer, how to plan the future. He didn't need me to decide his career. He chose to join the SAF on his own. He chose to go into politics on his own, discussing it with Go Chok Tong, who was Minister of Defense. He asked me, 
I said, think it over carefully. He just lost his wife in 84. Wife died in 82. I said, you're going to make it very difficult for yourself getting another wife because you had two young children. This is not a joke. We are not running this for ourselves. If we were, Singapore wouldn't be what it is. And let me tell you this. If what you say is reflective of your generation, then I'm a bit sad. But the generation that grew up with me, those over 55 are still 35% of the electorate. Those over 40, the 55 or 25 percent of the electorate, they are 60 percent. I think you take a poll of that generation and see whether they think I should step down. Mr. Lee, speaking about the future, right, are you, do you think that there will be a lack of political revival or leadership revival in the future because Singaporeans are getting apolitical? Singaporeans cannot get apolitical. What is political? Mr. Lee, if let's say we, this year our, our elections, mm. it's not compulsory. Let's say people could vote if they want no, no. to. How many people do you think will go to the votes? Let, let's just say there are no votes cast, except for the few contested areas, right? Mm. Have they become our political? Politics has got to do with your life, your future. Just a moment. Your life, your future. Things go wrong, you have no future. Correct, Mr. Lee, but things have not gone wrong. Uh, and if, let's say, if, <laughs> I, I say again, if votes or elections was not compulsory, yeah. people do not need to go to the polls, do not need to vote, how many percent of people do you think will go to the votes? That could be only 30%, 20%. Does this prove that Singaporeans are getting apolitical? No. It proves that they are so comfortable and so well looked after that they have decided, okay, you carry on. Correct, so nobody will take over. Would you see well, that as a mandate then? Would you see a, a law yes, voter as a mandate I'm as a saying, parties keep I, re I remind you what I've said, that I have not been contested for three successive elections. Mr. Lee, it's you know, not my, because my, I have no mandate. The, the context it's because, of it was... No, but it's because the opposition knows they cannot displace me. No, there the context that, of, of the whole thing was uh, assuming his scenario, assuming voting uh, is not compulsory, right. then you said... You Let know, us that's... assume it's not compulsory. And if voter turnout was low, so my question is... If no, and therefore low, they won't contest? Because, it, or they will contest? That because, no, and, and your answer to that was, if voter turnout is like 20%, it means that people are happy with the government, life is good, everything is fine. So my question is, if no. that's the case, if that's what you believe, does that mean that you see that as a mandate that the people are giving to the ruling party? Because they just I, I think it's so I good, they don't I don't see that care. as a mandate or non-mandate. I see that as a reflection of the inability of the opposition to produce a comparable team and the people are quite satisfied to leave it. The moment they are not satisfied, you see what happens in the Philippines. Right? There is an impression that the PAP is arrogant and even bully. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> if and I'm arrogant, would I be talking to you? I think, I think the impression... And are you bullied? No, maybe you let me explain why there is such a perception. I think um, in many of, for example, the libel suits against your political opponents okay. and, you know, the way they have been made bankrupt creates this perception that the PAP is very high-handed when it comes to dealing with dissent. And I think to a certain extent, it creates, um, a, it cre leads to sympathy votes for the underdog. Yes. But let me point out the consequences, right? Suppose I never sued Mr. Jayaratnam when he said that I gave a banking license to Tatli, Tatli Bank, because my brother was a director. I'll soon be smeared and thought corrupt, right? So my brother got a benefit, I must get a benefit too. I sued him. He denied that there was the meaning. So it went all the way up, court of appeal, into the Privy Council. We both had QCs. He lost. 
Having been taught that lesson, and he said that during election time, next election, he said, I didn't want the embarrassment of Te Chiang Wan, a minister then of national development, who was being investigated for a million dollars taken as a bribe. Because, so I told him to commit suicide. And again, it was election time. I don't sue. I sued. He lost. Then he goes and defames Ko Chok Tong and me on the eve of poll at Cheng San Constituency, 1997. What up the police report says, and this is, you know what it is, it's a crime. So I've committed a crime? So the whole thing was videotaped, fortunately, because we had the whole thing videotaped. And now, he has to pay for it. He knew the risk. He's a lawyer, he's not a fool. He's been down twice, third time. Supposing they were all unbiased cases. We have 2,000 lawyers in Singapore who have to respect the judges. You get a lawyer to read the law reports because the judge cannot give a judgment without a report, you know. Reporters are there, lawyers, count, counsel are there arguing. Is it right or is it wrong? What you are saying is, leave it, let him say it. No, I'm saying do not destroy them. If he can find the money to pay, he's not destroyed. He should not have said it at all, right? Lo Tia Kiang didn't have to say it to win, neither did Chiam. Mr. Lee, so, Mr. Lee, do you think in this age of walkover constituencies, in an age where you don't consider the opposition very much, why does our vote matter? Because, why am I talking to you? Because I think it is necessary for people like you and your generation to understand that this is not a business of just voting or not voting. That politics has got to do with your life, your job, your home, your Medicare, your children's future. Suppose it goes wrong. You don't need to go to, uh, to do political science to know that something has gone wrong, right? So it is necessary for you to understand that we are determined to maintain good government in Singapore. Without good government, we will rapidly go down. We have put in place a system which requires those who want to take over the government to be able and competent. So we locked up the assets. If the assets are not locked up, Lo Tia Kiang can say, Oh, Cheng Hu Chi, we will spend government's money. Why is it I give you free bus fares, I give you cut down electricity rates, etc., etc.? The money will disappear, no time. And the people will say, yes, yes, that's right, give it to us. But these are funds we have accumulated over the last 40 years and multiplied them for, we've got no oil, no gas, no timber, no whatever. This is it. There's a fallback for our currency, for our future. Without this, without a good government, Singapore will never be put to... Once a bad government gets in, as I said, we may be able to last one term because of the double key. But the second term, if a man is really good enough and win, he'll change the president to have his old man as president and everything will be spent. Mr. Mento, um, thank you for your time with us tonight. Um, on behalf of all of us, I think we're really grateful that we've got to go through all these difficult issues with you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I've enlightened you on why we do what we do. It's not for the f fun of it. It's for a very serious purpose 
to ensure a good government for Singapore and that an, an opposition, when it gets in, will be equally good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you.